have officially started. So hi, Melinda, thanks for doing this. Hi, um, thank you for inviting me. <laughs> so the first question I have for you is, why does Star Trek appeal to you? I think it's from childhood. Um, my dad read aloud to me, and then he taught me to read before I went to school. And the very first book he ever read to me was 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. But he would read all the exciting parts, you know, the, um, and, and not so much of the fish stuff, you know. So it, it just, you know, inspired me with this idea of exploration and, and visiting distant worlds. And in that case, it was, you know, under the sea, but it kind of led me toward wondering what was out there. And um, I've always loved science fiction. I read my way through the entire science fiction collection at the Ernie Pyle Library when I was a little kid. And we had to get permission because they had the science fiction in the adult section and they didn't want to let me in. And my parents were like, no, 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 she gets to read whatever she wants. And I started at A and I read all the way to Z um, on this very narrow shelf. And it was always spaceships more than unicorns that I loved. Um, and when I was a little girl, I dreamed of being an astronaut, um, only to be told girls can't be astronauts in that era. And uh, that always made me furious. So I think when Star Trek came along, it was like an answer to a dream. Uh, it was spaceships. It was women doing things that I was told women weren't allowed to do. Um, and I loved it. Um, and I, I couldn't bear to miss a show. And, you know, it was just, uh, it, it defined my childhood. Well, you wrote uh, one of the really cool Star Trek original novels, uh, Tears of the Singers. I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about how the late great David Hartwell got you involved in writing a Star Trek novel. Well, um, <laughs> I had been an attorney. I was trained as a lawyer. I practiced law for three years, hated it <laughs> and wanted out. And uh, my best friend at the time, who <clears throat> sadly has passed away, Victor Milan, encouraged me to start writing. And eventually I quit the law firm and because of Star Wars, but that's another story. And, um, and I was writing this big science fiction trilogy about a federal court judge writing circuit in outer space. But I couldn't seem to break through. I couldn't seem to get any attention. And I was at a world fantasy convention and I met David Hartwell and he and I ended up having a breakfast together and just talking. And he said to me, what you need is to be established um, as somebody who writes science fiction. And I edit this line of Star Trek novels. This was quite early when they were just starting these. He said, if, you know, if you'll send me an outline, um, let's think about it. So I was pretty excited <laughs> when I got back home. I sat with Vic and we kicked around some ideas, um, you know, sort of looking at the two bifurcations of Trek. That, well, there are three, really. There's the sort of comedic Trek, uh, Trouble with Tribbles, piece of the action. Then there was the, you know, hard-edged military, you know, balance of terror, those kind of stories. And then there were the softer, more humanistic, fluffier, <laughs> you know, Star Trek. And uh, I decided I wanted to do that. And also I loved Uhura. I was a singer. Um, I studied opera in Vienna, Austria before I realized I wasn't good enough to become a great opera star. And so that character and her beautiful voice and those moments in the rec room when she would sing and Spock would play the harp, I just loved those. So I focused on Uhura and I focused on music and baby white seals <laughs> and uh, that's how it happened and i sent in the outline and david bought it but he gave me a piece of very very good advice he said to me never write another star trek novel unless you want to become a media tie-in writer he said if you do more than one you're going to get shunted into that career path and if you're more interested in writing your own stories then I suggest you never do a second one. And so I followed his advice to the letter and I've never written another Star Trek novel. Well, you haven't written another Star Trek novel, but you got involved with Star Trek The Next Generation, the TV series. How did that come about? That came about because of my best friend. Um, you may have heard of him, a little known guy named George R.R. R. Martin. <laughs> oh, we, we have high hopes that George is gonna 
make it <laughs> a breakthrough. Um, George and I got to know each other a number of years ago, and we were in a, in a writer's group together. We were in a role-playing gaming group together. I mean, we've just been friends for a long time. And uh, George went off to Hollywood first to work on the new Twilight Zone and then to work on Beauty and the Beast. And um, one day my phone rang and it was George calling from Los Angeles. And he said, uh, hey, Snod, that's his nickname for me, he calls me Snod. He said, hey, Snod, I think you'd be pretty good at the screenwriting thing. You are very structured in your writing. I, I'm an outliner, I like to outline everything I write. You write very strong, pointed dialogue. You have very powerful characters. I think you'd be good at this. So I said, hmm, oh, okay. And George said, if you write a spec script, I will show it to my agent. So I didn't want to write a Beauty and the Beast because I thought that was unfair to George because if I really sucked at this, you know, it would put him on the spot. I looked at LA Law, but it looked like it was too tightly, um, uh, plotted and constructed for me to sort of slide in an episode, a spec episode. And having grown up on Trek, I thought, oh God, I, you know, I want Trek. I'm going to try that. So I started watching Next Generation and uh, I realized that Data for me was the most interesting character, which I do think is a little sad that the, the robot was, the, you know, the most, most fully human character, the most interesting character for me. But I thought that was the character I wanted to write about. And then I drew from my legal training and thought I am going to use a very um, horrible, horrible Supreme Court decision called Dred Scott, um, where the court ruled that um, Scott was not a person, but the property of his slave owner. He was a runaway slave. And uh, well, actually, he'd been brought into a free territory. Sorry, I'm going legal on you. And then sued, saying, I'm in a free territory now. Now I'm a free man. And the court said, no, no, you're still property. And I thought that would work really well for data. Was he a person with the property of Starfleet Command? Meanwhile, George had been giving me, coaching me, giving me advice about doing this script. And he said to me, you will never, ever sell your spec script. Your spec script is just a calling card. All it is is to show the per person who reads it that you're a good writer and that you have interesting ideas. And then hopefully what will happen is they will ask you to come in and pitch other ideas to them if you, know, you write a good script, but you're never gonna sell it. And I called George after I thought about this idea of using Dred Scott with data. And I said, uh, I've got this really great idea. And if I'm not gonna sell it, maybe I shouldn't waste it. Maybe I should hold it back as a pitch and write another idea. And George gave me the single best piece of advice I've ever gotten as a writer. He said to me, never hoard your silver bullet, which means lead with the very best thing you've got. So I wrote The Measure of a Man and sent it to George who gave it to his agent. And then she sent it into track. Um, and they not only bought it, they hired me on the show. <laughs> so that was sort of how I ended up on Next Generation, um, was through a good friend paying it forward and um, me taking the chance. You know, when somebody offers you an opportunity, you know, don't walk away, take the chance. Measure of a Man is one of the best Star Trek Next Generation episodes, bar none. So. Thank, thank you. you for thank you for taking the shot and uh, creating such an amazing episode. Um, so you worked on the show for the second season. What prompted you to leave, if I may ask? Well, I was actually there through all of the third season. Um, I came in after the writers' strike, so I only worked half the second season because they, the writer the WGA had gone on strike. So I worked half the second season. I worked all of the third season. Um, I learned a lot. I worked with some wonderful people, Rick Manning, um, Hans Beimler, Ira Baer, who was such a mentor to me. I love Ira. Uh, Ron Moore. Um, I found Ron's script in the slush pile and brought it to the attention of our producer, our writing producer. Um, but <laughs> Trek was a very difficult show. And um, as my friend Ricky says, uh, 
Star Trek puts the, the T in the S and PTSD. So um, at the end of the third year, I was, I was done. I was burned out and ready to walk away. Um, and I did, you know, and then ended up getting drawn back into Hollywood to go to work on a legal show called Reasonable Doubts, uh, which was a really great experience. I learned a tremendous amount working on that show as well about how to edit and casting and, you know, just a lot of things that we didn't get to do on Trek. So, um, and also I was the only woman above the line on Trek, uh, and I think that was, you know, made it a tad more difficult. Well, I'm sorry to hear that because talent should win overall. It doesn't matter what you are, if you know what I'm saying. Um, so you've had an amazing career, and what do you prefer doing? Do you prefer writing the novels or do you prefer writing for television? I prefer writing for television. Um, I mean, right now, because everything is shut down, I'm in New Mexico working on books again. Um, I love to write, so I don't particularly care, but I love writing screenplays. Um, I, I hate writing description, <laughs> and so um, I have to make myself do that. I love dialogue. I love two people interacting and you know bouncing off each other and communicating or fighting or, but words and dialogue to me are magical. And in a screenplay, that's how you're telling your story. Um, the rest of it gets filled in by other people, fight coordinators, directors, set designers, so forth. You're responsible for who are these people, why are they interesting, and how do you make them come to life? And you do that through the dialogue. And I love the fact that you can say so much with so little. And if you have a good actor, you can say so much with no talking, um, with merely a look. And I just, I just think that's magical. And we don't have that luxury in novels. We have to describe you know, what they're thinking and interior dialogue and internal dialogue to me is another thing I don't enjoy writing. If I can at all make it overt, put it in people's mouths rather than in their heads, I do that. Um, but Bottom line, I'll write no matter what. So, you know, I'm perfectly happy to work on a novel while we are getting through the plague here. You know. Yes, uh, <laughs> I was going to say the plague and everything. Um, David Morrell, who lives in New Mexico, also once told me that dialogue is conflict and conflict is dialogue. And um, I totally understand what you're saying. And um, yeah, I, I've been only writing novels and I'd love to dive into screenplays at some point, but that's for another time and story. Um, my question to you now is, um, I heard that when Star Trek Picard premiered, if you're okay talking about this, they brought back Maddox, they brought back that whole episode that you wrote, but they didn't notify you they were doing that? I'm, I'm a little confused about that. No, I, uh, the only reason I found out is because fans got in touch with me on Twitter or through Facebook and said, did you know that Picard is based on Measure of a Man? And I went, really? Um, no, I had no idea. Um, and so, you know, I was curious. And so I went ahead and signed up for CBS All Access. Don't know if I'm gonna keep it now, but uh, you know, to, to watch and see what they did. Um, so yeah, no, it was a complete surprise to me. I mean, I'm flattered that they thought so highly of the of the episode that they would use it as the foundation for their series. Well, I still say your episode's better. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> sure. So with all the Trek series out there, what is your favorite? And what is your favorite episode of that series? Oh, for me, it's always going to be, you know, uh, original Trek. Um, I think because it's what I found first as a kid. I fell in love with Kirk and Spock and McCoy. Um, and for me, um, it will always be, I mean, it's hard. There were so many great episodes. City on the Edge of Forever is my favorite original track ever, bar none. Um, but Journey to Babel is also wonderful. Um, and, and Charlie X, a little known, often overlooked episode. Um, again, about agonizing choices and, and having to make these decisions. And, and I loved original Trek because there was conflict between the people, um, between the crew, 
they weren't they didn't all just love each other and support each other perfectly they weren't perfect they were flawed individuals who by their connections between Kirk and Spock and McCoy, all of them became stronger, better people because of what they brought together and the disagreements they had. And I thought that was very powerful. I thought Next Generation ended up being feeling emotionally quite flat because there was very little opportunity for that. And, and I was excited in the fact that in, in a measure of a man, I was able to actually pit Picard and Riker against each other and um, have have a bit of a um, you know have that sense of of uh, Riker wanting to win. I mean, Riker having ambition and wanting to wanting to succeed, even if it meant he was going to hurt his friend, which was again agonizing decisions. So yeah, that to me was was important. Well, you mentioning that one of the best scenes is the end where Riker just feels so horrible because you know he tried very hard to win and data forgives him and it was just it was so beautiful i love that scene thank you um top two favorite star trek characters um spock and data and then I always get weird looks. Somebody asked me once, who's your favorite Star Trek captain? And I always pick Captain Pike, um, even though he didn't, wasn't in much and I haven't watched Discovery, so I don't know anything about the character as it's said there, but a man that Spock would go to such lengths to help um, says something about him. He must've been one, one heck of a commander, you know, if, if, that's, uh, if he engendered that kind of loyalty. So, but, but for me, it's Spock and Data. Um, I think because, you know, they're polar opposites. Spock is trying to deny his humanity and Data is trying to discover humanity. And so they're different sides of the coin. And I just, I, they're my favorite characters. Uh, for me, uh, with you saying that, I always thought that it was interesting that the non-humans were really the most human, if that makes sense. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, by Spock trying to deny humanity, it, it only elevates questions of what makes us human and what's important. Um, and Data frantically, you know, grasping for it, trying to discover it. Um, everything's always a reflection on what we're trying to learn. I mean, that's what stories do. Um, from time immemorial, they teach us, you know, how to be our best selves or how not to be not best self. Um, since you're a Captain Pike fan, I would recommend season two of Discovery. <laughs> uh, and the reason I say that's because I thought the actor they brought in and the whole Enterprise Captain Pike storyline worked really well. And uh, I'd love to see more of that, but who knows if they're going to do that or not. Um, that's what I hope to see in the future. What do you see as the future of Star Trek? Well, you know, I, if, if, if CBS were to come to me and say, what would you, what would you do? Um, you know, I have two things. Uh, one, I, you know, obviously I think that Starfleet Academy is sort of just hanging there waiting to be a CW show, you know, <laughs> I mean, get these 18 and 20 year olds and, you know, what's it like to be at Starfleet Academy? Um, but the one I really want to do, and they, they actually gave me hints of it in Picard, which is what, what I did like about Picard, is that the universe isn't sort of this utopia. There are rough edges. And I've always wanted to do a show about the rogues and rascals of Star Trek, the people sort of living in the cracks, you know, and trying to pull a con and, you know, trying to trying to do something illegal. And for them, the arrival of Starfleet is like, oh, no, God, oh, no, it's Starfleet, oh, God. <laughs> you know, how do, we, how do we get out of this? How do we avoid the Federation, the boot of the Federation on our necks? Because that's how they would join. It would basically be a show more about the hairy muds of the universe and less about, you know, the people up here, but the people living down in the, in the shadows. Um, and, you know, I, I, I've even sort of toyed with, you know, I'd have like a disgraced Starfleet officer who's on this ship of, 
you know, ship of rogues and, uh, you know, what are they up to? What, what are they doing as they sort of make their way through, um, you know, trying to put one over on the Vulcans because, you know, God, those people are so easy to, to, to con because they're so, <laughs> they're, they're, they're so focused and, you know, it would just be fun. I mean, I'd like to see what that world looks like. And Picard gave me a t hint of that with, you know, the, the sort of vigilantes that Seven of Nine is working for. And like, I really wanted to know about the Romulan pirate dude, you know, who shot them up in one episode. I was like, you know, what's his ax to grind? How did he, you know, get a bird of prey and go away to become a, a pirate king? And, you know, um, and I, I felt like that just got dropped. I was like, why does, why is he shooting at them? What was, the, what was the story there? They could have built that into that episode better. I mean, um, that they paid the bribe to him and then the check bounced or whatever, you know, I mean, I had, I was sitting there thinking, hmm, <laughs> you know, who's that guy? Um, so that would be the show I would really, really want to do. I would sign up to help you with that in a heartbeat. That sounds great. <laughs> why, why do you think Star Trek's endured for so long? Uh, because I think there's nothing wrong with optimism and happy endings. Um, I mean, there's so much dystopia and, and God knows, you know, I've written some of it um, and sometimes it feels like we're living in one. Um, you know, Trump is president, <laughs> there's a plague. Um, but I think the idea that we can be better, uh, we can listen to the better angels if, of our nature, um, and that that spirit of adventure is possible and the stars are waiting. I think that's, I think for many people, that's exciting. And, and it is hopeful. And I don't see anything wrong with some hope and, and joy and um, in these times, I guess. So I think that's been the thing that, that has endured. I mean, the message of respect and adventure and all of us pulling together to do something amazing is, is a great message. I absolutely love that, thank you. Um, is there anything else you would like to mention for this that uh, I haven't asked you or you haven't talked about? Um, no, not really. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, uh, I mean, you know, I, I'm working on uh, getting my books sort of available again. I'm trying a new experiment with indie pubbing. Um, and uh, so, you know, just at some point, uh, in the near future, there should be a number of my books available. So if people are interested in reading more about my other stories, uh, I have a space opera series and I do this thing about the war between science and rationality and superstition, religion, and magic. Uh, I come down on the side of science and rationality. Um, those books are going to begin to be available. So um, that would be it. Just shameless plug. <laughs> but that's, that's what I'm doing. Well, my wife is a scientist, so thank you for that, by the way. And <laughs> I will look forward to seeing those. Um, so I'm going to stop the recording here. And thank you for doing that. Hang on. <laughs>